Hi, everyone. Althea Kaminsky here for The Learning Scientist. And today I wanted to talk to you a bit about a very recent article that I just read and found incredibly interesting titled, Not Everybody Has an Inner Voice, Behavioral Consequences of Anendophagia. Um, so anendophagia refers to the lack of inner speech and it looks like actually in this article, they're coining the phrase. Um, this is sort of, this This is new, this is interesting. So to put this in context and to explain why I thought this was really cool and wanted to talk about it and share it with everybody. Um, when I talk to people about the importance of dual coding, I usually start explaining this in the context of multitasking, usually talking about um, the scenario where you are watching a PowerPoint presentation, perhaps, and there is a bunch of text up on the screen and the teacher, the instructor is talking and explaining what's on the slide while someone is taking notes. So during that, what tends to happen is you are reading the words on the screen, you're listening to the person talking and you're writing notes which is three different sources of verbal information that all rely on, and to some degree, on your inner voice to process, right? As you're reading something, you tend to read that in an inner voice. Um, you can think about this if you read books, you maybe like get, uh, you can hear it in, some, in that character's voice. Uh, when I get emails from people, I can like read it in their voice, like I can hear them saying it. Um, and then when you're writing notes, right, you tend to write out your thinking, what words you're writing as you're writing it or typing it either way. Uh, and then you also have somebody talking. Uh, so one way that we can demonstrate the use of your inner voice is I will pause for a second and ask you to count to 10 in your head. Okay. If you counted to 10 in your head, you likely did that um, similar to how you would say it out loud, right? So if you're a fast talker, you probably counted to 10 pretty fast. If you're a slow talker, you probably counted slowly, right? That's just to kind of, people have different cadences in their speech. If you're bilingual or multilingual, um, you maybe counted in whatever language you are most comfortable using, um, although that varies sometimes bilingual or, or multilingual people. I mean, you switch language based on the context. Um, so that's that's interesting, that's different. Um, so we we use verbal information. We use our inner voice to help to help us process verbal information. In the context of dual coding, that helps us to understand why we get a benefit when we combine pictures and words, right? Because we can process the pictures without using that inner voice, right? So I can look at a picture and listen to a description of it and see you know words over it, and it's not as difficult to do both. So I'm getting the benefit of sort of different types of information. Uh, pictures can add lots of context. Uh, so not only is it adding more information, it's non-competing information versus if I had a, you know, a phrase or something that I'm trying to describe and add context and more information to, but I'm doing that verbally, that's kind of competing with the words that are already written, right? So dual coding relies on that. The inner voice also explains certain contexts of multitasking where um, we are, the task is different, verbal tasks that rely on our inner voice. So that's generally how we think of that in cognitive psychology. However, as I mentioned from this study, we're beginning to be more aware of the fact that your inner voice, just like most things, most cognitive processes that we have, have a level of variation. Some people rely more on their inner voice. They will report working through problems as if um, having a conversation with yourself, right? Like, oh, I'm having an argue with myself. I wonder if I do this through this. No, that won't work, right? Um, I suspect I haven't taken the kind of test that they gave people to rank them on high or low inner voice, but I would expect that I have a high inner voice just because I feel like I'm always kind of talking about, like it, everything that they describe as a high inner voice sounded more like how I approach things. But there are people who have a low inner voice who scored more low on that scale. Um, and these are people who are like, no, I don't really think I like talk to myself or have conversations. I tend to picture things more. I just don't, don't do that as much or not at all. So in this study, they took people, uh, they people, 
they ranked them. And so people who scored high in the top 40%, and they said, okay, these are people who are high inner voice people. And people who scored low, like 16, I think the 16th percentile um, and below were the low inner voice, right? So we have high people who rely on the inner voice, high and low. And they gave them a variety of different cognitive tasks to see, like, does this affect how we process information? The um, One of the differences that they found was in a task where people were shown pictures and then asked to remember the pictures and whether or not they rhymed, right? So how can a picture rhyme? Well, the, for example, they would show a picture of a sock and then later a picture of a clock. And you'd have to know if sock and clock rhymed. Not difficult if you saw the sock and thought sock and you see the clock and you think clock, right? Then it kind of stands out to you. But if you're not processing it that way, if you're not relying as much on your inner voice, that became harder. And that's what they saw is that people with the low inner voice performed more poorly on that task. They had them do other cognitive tasks where there were no differences. Um, there were tasks involving math problems, um, solving math problems silently, there, no difference there. So it's likely the people um, with the inner voice didn't say it out loud or did, again, just didn't rely on verbal processing or an inner voice to handle that. Um, it was, I would imagine more visual, but we don't know. Um, and what was the other task? The other task, um, uh, oh, they're just like other like picture tasks. So again, it's not that there's a difference on everything. It, the, the researchers found what they thought they would find that if the task relied on process, uh, processing something using your inner voice, then that determined, right, how well people did. So this is really interesting. Uh, we don't quite know yet what the implications are for things like sitting in a class and watching a PowerPoint. Um, but again, this is something that comes up and that I do sometimes get questions over and wonder when I do these demonstrations, most people do report um, what I described where they say, oh yeah, that's that voice in my head. What is that, right? And we have a good conversation. But every once in a while, I would get somebody in class who would say like, I don't know, I kind of just saw the numbers or I didn't, you know, I did something different. Um, so it's really interesting that we're starting to learn more about this variation. Um, I will put a link to the paper and to the nice, there was a short NPR article, which is how I saw it, um, that really summarized the paper nicely. So um, I hope you all find that interesting as well.